in the door with clockwise. For the less technical, the more emotional, philosophical side of music, do check out our podcast. Link below and or search on your podcast app. Anyway, this is In The Door, so let's go In The Door. I am only alive in the free fall. By the way, nice mustache. No, oh, cheers, man. <laughs> I've grown it myself. <laughs> so proud of you. So I'm really intrigued with not only your sound design, I, I guess it would be considered the, the, the first drop section. So it's... That's it. Go. I'm really, really intrigued by your sound design, but also by the sequencing. The sequencing is incredible. The, the, the way that you portray this is incredible. So can, can, can we uh, talk about how you sequenced these, uh, the, these different bases and these different synths? Because it's definitely not like one's hitting on one, one's hitting on two, one's hitting on three. It's like, it's really intricate. Like I mentioned earlier, I'll usually like start with smashing out a chord progression that fits on like the, the main vocal part or whatever. Uh, then I'll just shift that and try to make a drop out of it. I'll have like a sub run in and then just put different bases and fills and stuff on top of that sort of that fit that progression. Gotcha. So you got your sub going and then uh, let's see, let's go uh, down to is, is most of your, your bases, your, your, your bass growls and all that kind of stuff or, or most of them bounce out to audio at this point or do you still have the patches? I think most of them are going to be audio by now. Oh, there's a Reese thing here, which is... Oh, what's that one? I mean, like most of them, my, my sound design is uh, like I'll have a different project where I do like different bass sounds and stuff like that. I'll make like my own sample packs and stuff like that, and then just chuck them in a new project whenever I'm making one. So last time we actually had this is really cool that you're doing the AU5 remix, but I guess two times ago we had AU5 on here and we talked about the importance of exactly what you're talking about. Of you don't have to do your sound design in the same session, and in fact, it's it's encouraged not to. It's encouraged that you go and you have fun and you design your own sounds completely away from from the original uh, session that you have here. So this is this is actually really really cool. There there's this one bass growl that hits right on the one, and it sounds like it explodes into a bunch of reverb, and then and then comes right back into it. Do you know the one I'm talking about? It's got to be this one. That's the one. Uh, do, do you remember uh, how you created that uh, sound? Because that's, that's a really, I like that sound a lot. Uh, this one. I think the process behind that was, I think I started with like two sine waves, just a little bit detuned. And then it's just layers of soft, a bit of soft clicking, maybe a bit of like a guitar amp. I put like a frequency shifter just a little bit off on the frequency and then just a little bit of dry wet to get that sort of phasing going on. It's just lots of layers of stuff. To get that reverb throw sound where basically like it explodes into a reverb and then quickly comes back in, how did you achieve that? Yeah, so it's like a reverb band turning off and on. So it's just going like that. And the one that sells it is this one. So it creates like that suction effect, so you know what I mean? Yeah. Such you back into the beat song. Yeah, so, so, so these, these little noises and stuff you're making, um, do you then, uh, so in terms of the notes they're playing, do you, do you have to basically then kind of figure out what note you originally made and then kind of transpose it up and down to fit the key of the track? Um, or, or do you do it more, more by it? Yeah, exactly. That's usually the case. But the thing is, like, I use, uh, I'll make most of my bases in F. So I have that to go up. So uh, it's just, I don't know, it's sort of just the good bass key, so more or less. No, that makes sense. It's actually, uh, for you bass producers out there well actually anyone should know this this is just really good so people who make very strong bass music where the sub is a huge part of it uh it's highly encouraged to create a song anywhere from the key of e to the key of g um any higher the 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 sub becomes more or less kind of weak and any lower it gets to a point where most systems can't properly translate that or most humans can't hear that so F has been uh, basically the industry standard for bass music just because it's right in the middle of that E to G area and it pounds really, really hard, right? Exactly, yeah. What key is this song in, just out of curiosity? A sharp. Oh, that's so weird. <laughs> no, that's still cool. It usually, like, it's only in, like, the sub is hitting A sharp just, like, half of the time usually, and then it's just lots of Fs and lots of D sharps as well. And are those notes from the sub, are they from the chord progression? Um or separate 
like this one goes a bit all over the place. So it's yeah, A sharp and F sharp, D sharp. So there's a lot of A sharp and F sharp and D sharp, I think. Gotcha. Okay. So it looks like, I mean, just from, from looking at that, that MIDI sequence right there, it looks like it was in F sharp. Let's see. Uh, one, two, three, F sharp. It's in A sharp, but I put a B in there sometimes as well, which is the flat second. Oh, okay. That makes sense. You hopping over to the Locrian mode. That makes sense. That's that's pretty dope. Okay. How much do you think consciously about music theory when you're create, when you're kind of working on the track, um, or is it all just more based on on feel? Uh, it's a lot of both, to be fair. Like as I mentioned, uh, like earlier, when I like grab the vocal or whatever and try to make a chord progression underneath that, I'll usually try to make a MIDI clip of uh, like the vocal melody, like pick the melody out just so I can see exactly which notes are going on, so I know what will work sort of underneath it. So I'm just trying to pick it up by ear and then just play around with it. Because I haven't got perfect pitch, so I don't just know if something fits. Have it in MIDI, just see like the actual notes. Awesome. And and you're working from a remix, so did you have to like reverse engineer what key the original elements are in? Um, or, or did it not, not matter too much in this case? I can usually pick the key out by ear. I mean, not just hear it and say what key it is, but I mean, if I like hear the track and just grab an instrument and just fiddle around. And I'll just, um, as I, I'll hear like the tonic of it somewhere. It's I've got good relative pitch, but not perfect pitch. In regards to the arrangement of this song, I I found that the more I listened to it, the more intrigued I was because it, and 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 maybe I didn't look at it deep enough or, or the right way, but I kind of felt like the the arrangement of it, the way it was laid out, wasn't like a traditional electronic music song. Am I wrong, or 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 did you purposefully try to make it? weird no yeah i definitely know what i mean and yeah it's mostly purposeful sort of i like having a sort of having tracks that constantly progress somewhere new you know what i mean i love like you know standard edm formats as well like just verse build up drop uh, verse build up drop but for me i just think it's more fun to work on tracks that are constantly like expanding and going somewhere else that's awesome dude do you do you kind of have like a like a strategy when you do that or is it kind of like because i mean for me we're looking at this right now what i would do if i was if i was lucas as I was looking at this, basically the way that I would think about it is that like basically I would have certain sections that everyone knows, but then in between those sections is when I would basically throw a wrench into the machine and make something super dope. You know, I, I would basically say I need an intro, a verse, and a drop, and anything else between all of those, I would basically do whatever I want. Does that make sense? I think like in this one, I have sort of got that structure going. You know, you got your intro, uh, like this bit, then you got your verse and a quick little build up thingy here. And then there's like the first drop is this thing. And then it's sort of just a verse again and a build up here and then just a second drop. But it's like the verses and builds are different, you know what I mean? Okay. That's the first time. So it's sort of like a good old linear progression, but changes up all the time. I quite like how you've, uh, how you've named your sections. I get asked quite a lot how to arrange a track. And obviously, obviously there is like the standard structure almost. I mean, there's kind of is, is and there isn't. Um, but my answer has always been, instead of thinking of it in terms of like verse, chorus, build, drop, and so on, instead kind of think of it more in terms of energy and what's involved. So I really like how you, you haven't just called it like verse drop build verse drop build or whatever oh yeah exactly yeah yeah because it's a it kind of sums up that it's, it's more about writing different musical sections than it is just to kind of have this standard standard shape almost that doesn't really exist how did you go about writing the say the section that's in that says drop versus the the more the more vocal chops i'm i'm guessing some of the elements came from well, i'm pretty sure some of the elements came from the earlier on in the track but then yeah how did that sort of sort of come together i mean it's sort of like you said though it's about the sort of energy that I want the sections to have, how I want them to feel. Because I, I wanted this bit, like the first drop, whatever, to be a bit more, you know, techy and lots of stuff going on and little fills and edits and stuff like that. There's just like lots of vocal chops, uh, softer kick and snare. Yeah, sort of chill, techy bit. And this one is just dropping caps. And that's how I wanted it to feel, just big and bombastic and lots of energy sort of. So I think that aligns pretty well with the, like what you're saying there. And, and how long would, it, would a track like this take? I think this one, Within the span of a month, I'm like working on it between one and two hours a day, but sometimes it'd be like five hours, sometimes it'd be like not at all. But I think somewhere between 50, 75 hours, maybe. That's pretty standard. I mean, right, that's that's kind of like the, the, the average answer we usually get. I mean, unless you're AU5 and you crank it out in a day, which is... Exactly, yeah. Which is ridiculous, but... <laughs> I, just, I can't understand that. I could not make a track in a day because it's like, I have to let the ideas like simmer and like take them in and reflect on what I do, what, what I want to do with them and stuff like that. 
which I think is important. I'm really glad that you brought that up because, I mean, we look at AU5 that came in the other day and he was able to create an amazing song in basically, I, th- I can't remember if it was like a day or three days or something like that. It was it was a relatively short amount of time. And then we look at something like this where it took more, but how you said that like, I need the time to, to let it simmer, let it slow cook. And that's okay. Like there's literally nothing wrong with that. And I think people need to understand that because I feel like when they hear that such and such person can crank out a song in, in a day or a couple days or, or, or whatever it is, they kind of start to feel self-conscious about it and they start to feel inferior, you know, because they'll, they'll, they'll go and try and they just can't like, just, just like for some reason they just can't, you know, whether it's just like creatively or what. And I think it's important to know that not one shoe fits all, you know, how you're saying if something like this for you to truly express yourself through music takes, you know, over the course of a month and in doing it, you have to, you can only work an hour or two a day on it, dude, high five. That's okay. You know what I mean? As long as you know how your mind and your creativity works, that's the important part. Oh yeah, definitely. I get what you mean. Totally. Uh, I've sort of had that sort of self-consciousness about it as well, because I usually like tracks will take a month or more. Like I've got in whole EP, which has been in the works for I don't know, half a year, one year, something like that. Yeah. And the, those tracks are nowhere near finished. But then you have like, uh, if you guys know Vorso, uh, because I mean, he's had a period now where he's just like every other day, like, oh yeah, this track's finished. I started this one, this one's finished. He'll start something one day and like, the next day it's finished. And I was thinking like, oh, man, am I doing something wrong here? How is he doing that? Good tracks, definitely good tracks. No, I, I and I think that like we as, as musicians, like once we understand how long it takes us to create a song effectively, you know what I mean? To, to properly convey our feelings and emotions or whatever through a song i feel like it would benefit us to learn how to do it basically as fast as possible you know what i mean i feel like you know because it would be wonderful to be able to have a feeling to have an idea and be able to get it out as quick as possible i if i had the choice between a week and a month i would take a week but to basically measure your progress to measure your workflow to measure your worth to someone else's yardstick is you're setting yourself up to fail definitely because, I mean, everybody's got a different workflow. Exactly. And and at the end of the day, I mean, yes, m- most of the people that we talk to, including yourself, this is your livelihood. This is your business. And so it does have to, you know, be done in a timely manner and everything. But at the end of the day, like, we make music because it's fun. We make music because it's it's enjoyable. Something resonates with us. And so once you start, like, adding processes or, or standards that take away from that, it just, I don't know, it just taints it. How much do you think about, I suppose, like, what you... Yeah, what what you might call like fan expectations almost or kind of making a track that you think you should be making based on your, your current audience or I think the short answer is a lot, to be honest. Like right off the bat I've made sort of very well, it's complex music. There's lots of stuff going on, new stuff happening all the time and there's weird sounds and it's a producer genre sort of. I mean like look, mostly like producers listen to the stuff that I make. A while ago I was very hesitant to make like heavy tracks like dubstep and stuff like that, which isn't as intricate as the stuff I've made in the past. Because I thought that people would be like, oh, he's selling out now. He's just making dubstep and trap and stuff like that. So but I'm sort of trying to let that go and just you know, have fun doing it. Just be as creative as I want to be and do what I want to do. On the section right there where it says more vocal chops, softer kick, it looks like uh, in your in your drum section, it looks like some quite intricate drum programming is going on or something. Something, something looks pretty intense. What You mind if we uh, take a listen to that just really quick? That's super dope, dude. Cheers. So let's let's go through some of that. I mean, some of that was really, really. I love intricate, like dope drum programming. Just to, to me, it just adds like such a groove and such a you know such a vibe to it. So let's talk about what what was some of your processes and what was some of the samples that you used. Like processes is that is that like usually I make all my drums myself or or at least like try to make new ones with layers and stuff like that. I don't synthesize everything, uh, but this one I think is just raw out of a sample pack and then just a bit bit of EQ, a bit of soft clipping, and stuff like that. There's nothing too advanced with that because it sounded very good just right off the bat. Like usually with the like claps and stuff like that, is usually lots of layers and different things. A wet clap thingy. I think this is 
some sort of grain thing. Uh, and this is another snap. So it's usually like when I'm making percussion and stuff, I mean, I've got like an entire folder here somewhere uh, and I'll have like a folder for every track. So I think I've got. Oh, dude, this, this is awesome. Really quick, because did you learn this from Frequent, this this technique? Uh, no, actually, I was doing this like before I even knew of him. Okay, okay. Oh, I was just wondering because it's so last week we had Frequent on here and he was talking about this exact thing. We're taking your old tracks, running them through a, a granulator or some type of grainy sound and be able to use those basically as percussive elements. So this is super cool that you're doing it. No, oh, cheers. Yeah, so that, like that's what I do. Like with these sounds, I'll just take like uh, when I've got a fair bit into the making on the track, I'll just export like the main beat, sort of smack it into. I usually use FL's granulizer. So you use FL's granulizer. Uh, have you used uh, the granulator too before? Yeah. Oh yeah, a fair bit. But I mean, I just prefer like the FL granulizer for some reason. Perfect. So wh wh why so? I, I honestly didn't even know the FL granulizer even existed. What's the difference? Do you mean, <laughs> like practically? I mean, in the uh, the FL granulizer, there are like four controls that I mainly use, which is like the grain size, wave size, grain attack time, like the whole time or something. And I just find those controls way easier to like manipulate and get the results that one instead of the, uh, the max for live granulator thing. I really like this org organizational structure because not too many people do it, to be honest, even that kind of feels like a really logical thing to do that I see def definitely some of the top pros do. Because not, not only does it give you like a whole bunch of samples to, to play with your own, but it also, I suppose, helps cultivate a, a unique sound almost because um, you, you end up using the odd, odd little sound you've used before. Oh, yeah, that's definitely true. I like use uh, samples from old tracks and stuff like that, like resample things. Uh, unless they're copyrighted samples, so I'm a bit careful with like remixes, and you know, remixes and stuff. Uh, so like, I've got this painted white remix uh, where I've done doing some stuff with a beat. But I think I included like original drum samples in that from the track. Uh, so I'm not using them f for anything else. I do think Trevor and Nick would be fine with it, but yeah, yeah probably. But you know, don't want to step on any toes. Exactly. You might as well err, err on the safe side. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, question: Yesterday, when you and I met, so you were talking about how you have FL rewired to Ableton. Is that particularly for the granulator kind of thing? Or is there other reasons how, why you do that? <laughs> to be honest, I think I just accidentally did that sometime and I don't know how to fix it. So like <laughs> usually I'll just like, uh, like I said, render like the main beat or something or the main bass line from uh, a track that I'm working on, close Ableton, and go in FL and just have a session with like that, those sounds and just render a bunch of different like green, green things. So the primary reason why you do go over there is mostly for the, the grain thing, right? Yeah, I don't use Ethel for anything else. It's just the granulizer. Is there any other DAWs that you use for a specific reason like that? Like they have a certain function that you like? Uh, no, it's just Ethel and Ableton. Uh, yeah, so just uh, kind of circling about very slightly. So all this like really fast, intricate uh, percussive sounds and stuff, are they all on the grid or do you occasionally put, kind of move things off, off the grid? With this track, it's all on the grid because I wanted it to sound very precise and like on the beat very clean. Is, is that what you normally do or do you, or do you sometimes move stuff off the grid uh, as, as well? Because I'm always kind of undecided. Like, like I, I go through phases of thinking this style of music tends to be best on the grid and then occasionally uh, I think it sounds like slightly faster sometimes, like very slightly off the grid and I still haven't quite really made my, made my mind up yet. Yeah, I think uh, for me it just depends on the vibe that I'm going for with the track. Well, like this section at least, I was going for a very precise, techy, very choppy vibe. I wanted everything to be like on point, you know, I mean, but if I'm working on something that needs to have a bit more swing, sort of a bit more groovy, uh, I'll usually just move things over just a bit millisecond there, millisecond there, sort of just depends on the vibe of the track, sort of. Definitely. And uh, how, how, how protective do you have to be over these little like sounds in terms of not like like maybe caution them through like a limiter later or, or is it all reasonably okay? Like in the sound design stage, it's just smash a limiter on it and just have fun with it, which can lead to a bit of trouble in the mixing stage. But I think like most of these are just done without too much afterthought. So uh, some of them are limited a bit. Uh, because when you smack them in the granulizer, like it'll pick out a peak from a snare and then just be like the subsection of the kick for a bit and then just go straight into a snare again. So you'll get like these random peaks going on. I wonder if that's visible. The, uh, I mean, like, yeah, there's a good example. You've got a clear, very clear transient there. Let's see if I, uh... So, I mean, you don't hear that transient too much with the limber on it. But you hear that little right there. I don't know if that's translating very well, but... Yeah, I can hear it. Yeah, that's it. So and then you slam the limiter on it and it's just... 
a lot more even. What was that? The little thing with the uh, vocoder I saw with the noise. Yeah, oh, what's this? Oh, yeah. It's a thing that I learned from culprit. It's using the vocoder to just put noise in things. So it's just a little rack. So it's just one of them is just clean. Sounds like that. Uh, and one of them is just noise, I think. Yeah, uh, from the vocoder. This one isn't doing very brilliantly, but yeah. And then you put them together and it's just a bit more information in the high end, basically. Interesting, just to give you more of a full sound. Yeah, exactly. It's good for kicks and stuff like that to get a bit more like um, attack to it. Why on the on the uh, on the vocoded version uh, did you pan it fourteen left? Was that just a creative decision or no idea? <laughs> like maybe it's more high end heavy. And I think like the original. Yeah, it's a bit more heavy on the right side especially in the high frequencies, so I just saw we, we, we can't hear it because it's mono, but we'll, we'll trust you on that. Oh yeah, exactly, yeah, I forgot about that. But yeah, so I just try to combat like the, the stereo image a bit there. I noticed you're automating the pan on the utility. Oh yeah, that's just to get a bit more like stereo from sort of. Uh, it won't be audible on the thing, but. So that's just to get more stuff going on in the stereo image to make it a bit more interesting than just having anything slam in the middle. Yeah, it's just to get more stuff going on a bit of everywhere. In the second drop, uh, you have a very interesting, I guess the term would be super saw, but uh, where it's more of like this paddish I th kind of thing that wasn't in the first drop. Yeah, go ahead and play it just for a second. <laughs> So yeah, that 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 kind of like super sawish sound. Do you mind if we check that out for a minute? Yep. A bit of strings as well. That's awesome. Let's. I'm really interested. So is is that a choir in there? Oh, it's this one. It's a Savoy Zando thing. What? Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I've never heard of that before. No, I just literally went on Google and was like choir samples. Uh, I just found this one. It worked well for me. It's a whole sort of uh, library orchestral thingy. Have you, uh, have you enjoyed it? Have you found that it gives you good results? I mean, it works well for the choir, like having string pads and stuff like that. But it's not so good with like solo instruments. It doesn't have a lot of like expression. I've noticed uh, really quick, I've noticed that you've put the actual Ableton reverb on a lot of the tracks. Um, is that, do, do you not send them to an external reverb or, or, or how come you're doing that? Uh, I mean, usually I'll want like different sizes and decay times and stuff like that for lots of different sounds. I mean, I do have like a few sounds, uh, like this one, which is a big expansive verb. It depends on if you want to like be able to close and open the reverb independently of everything else, or if you want to have something that's just going to keep on ringing. So, okay, I see, I see what you're saying. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, because now that I'm thinking back to your song, uh, you're right. Your your reverb with certain sounds that explodes comes in has different decay times, different sizes, and stuff like that. So yeah, okay. It, on like a it basically like a sound design sense, I guess you would say it it, it makes sense. Yeah. If you got like a reverb that you're automating to use this one, that, no. But if you like, just take this one and do it like that. And, oh, are you? Uh, you're gonna get like everything. It's gonna take everything from here as well into the reverb. And if it's a long one, you're still gonna hear that stuff, even if you automate it up over here but if you do it on a send you just do like that it's literally literally just going to grab like that section that you're sending into it you know what i mean there's just a slight difference but it's a bit cleaner if that's making sense about do you always do reverb in, in the in the same way like this um or do you mix it up depending on the tracks it's usually just a mess of different reverbs to be honest but yeah i'll usually have a lot of separate reverbs and then just a few sends yeah like this one is just as i said a big one Yeah, sending the lead into that. There's no particular reason behind that sort of, it's just a sort of the sound the same thing, I guess, yeah. And uh, for the EQ and stuff, again, something that quite a lot of people ask, uh, so, so, ha, what's kind of guiding, guiding your e EQing? Is, is it literally just uh, sweeping through and, and doing it by ear? Or are you, say, boosting one, uh, one, one element at one frequency and then cu cutting that same frequency on a different element? Uh, it's not too strategic, to be honest. I'll just like listen to to a section on the track and if i hear just something like a harsh frequency around 2k or something like that find the source and just cut that out see how that sounds uh, if it sounds a bit too weak bring it a bit up again but it's just like listening to the track and 
trying to hear what's what doesn't sound so good. Question with your your lead in there. I heard uh, quite a bit of. Uh, I think I believe it was in the build um, um, that you were just barely showing this. Uh, I, I heard quite a lot of pitch bend. I was wondering how you achieve that. Is it, is it this one? Yeah. Uh, that's from the original, actually. Oh, that's that's from the AU5 song. Oh, okay, that's cool. So, okay. All right, different question then. On your drum bus, uh, I noticed that you had an ozone on there, and I was wondering what you... Oh, wait, maybe it wasn't on the drums. Maybe it was on something else. It could be an imager on the... Uh, it so it's just to work with the stereo imaging of the, the basses here, because I think they were sounding a bit mono. That's so interesting, because literally, like, I don't know if we've had anyone on the series that hasn't had Ozone 5. I, I don't think anyone's had newer than 5. Most of the algorithms that most people use have been the same from like five to six to seven and stuff. Uh, so like the imaging, I mean, I, I suppose they introduced a, a mono eyes, or not like a stereo eyes thing, or, or, or mono eyes. So that they've introduced a few, a, a few new additional features, but all like your standard imaging stuff, your IRC three algorithm, your standard EQing, all that, all that's kind of remained constant. Um, and also, they did take some features out after going from five to six. Uh, so yeah, there are some reasons that you sometimes want to use five. The the feature that they took out, correct me if I'm wrong, but the feature they took out in five, which was like a huge slap in the face. Sorry, I love Isotope, but this was a huge slap in the face. Is basically, it was the EQ matching, right? Or, or basically you could take a snapshot of an EQ curve on a song and so that you could match that to your to yours. And they, they no longer have that, right? Well, that's a bummer. There's a few features they put back in. Like, like I think they took out module presets initially. Um, and then they, they put that in for like 6.1. Um, and there's also a few, I think on the imager, there's, there's technically slightly less buttons on it. Um, although I suppose their logic is there were buttons that not many people used. Uh, so they were, they were just edge cases. Question for you really quick. Uh, concerning the vocals that you used in here, I, I mean, obviously Christina, she's, she's an incredible singer, unbelievable singer. Was there anything that you did to her vocals or, or did in this song that wasn't in the original song? I think I might have done some harmonies, but nothing advanced, just like pitching up. But yeah, like you see, they're 12 semitones, so it sounds like a bloody smurf, I think. Yeah. Gotcha. But I think I've done like very simple harmonies. Yeah, like fifth up there. Gotcha. Okay, I gotcha. That, that doesn't usually work, just in like very, very small sections when they're doing notes that will harmonize correctly when you pitch it a fifth up. Gotcha, that makes sense. And then, uh, and I believe it was in the first trail. Let's see. Go, go ahead and go back to the left a little bit. Uh, and then, yeah, it looks like you got some vocal chops right there in the, in the more vocal chops section. <laughs> That's funny. Okay. So basically, it's a very, very, uh, I, I, cause if I remember right in this particular section, you were kind of more so focusing on like the, the little drum percussion that you had and also like the, 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 the sound design portion. And so kind of the, the vocal in a sense, more or less became a percussion instrument or took a back seat basically. Right. Yeah. Like these, uh, uh, what are they called? Locators don't always coincide with what's actually going on. It's, it'll usually be like a reminder of something that I want to do. Oh, interesting. Like when I'm just about to, I don't know, go to bed because it's like 4 a.m. or something and I'm working on track, uh, I'll usually leave, leave like little footnotes of stuff that I still want to do. Um, yeah, I noticed you got, uh, I think it was on the on the, yeah, the vocal layers, you had a, a reverb running into an, another reverb. Was it a... Uh, did, did I say that right? It was a small reverb going into big one. And is, is that something you normally do? It's a bit of a, I do it sometimes. It's just to give like the sound a little bit of space first. Just maybe like add a little bit more stereo information and then just have something that's just very big and expansive and long. Because like when, you, when you've got very short reverbs, it sort of almost adds to the tone, like the actual tone of the sound that you're putting in on. Yeah, I, I probably just thought it sounded good with both of those going on at the same time. Really quick, what's what, is that a staccato section? Is that what that says? Uh, yeah, staccatos. Is that your uh, strings and whatnot? Oh, uh, that's that's more sando thing again. Oh, that's just the clip that's called that. So yeah, it's that more sando thing. It's like the the standard string library in Ableton, and it's another small sando thing. And so I'm assuming that all these notes that you're that you're using is from the original, uh, well, not the original, but the chord progression that you created around this song, right? Oh, sort of, yeah, like these, I think it's just playing like the tonic and the fifth. Yeah, because that will just fit over any chord progression sort of that's going on. If it's just a regular like minor scale. And then you got, let's say, do you have basically the three different sections of uh, the traditional like like viola, cello, violin kind of 
trio going on or what are what is what are the three different ones no idea let's see so we've got a violin pizzicato cool and i think i've got the octave on that oh just a staccato thing and it's string ensemble so it's probably a bunch of different ones and this one is staccato as well just violins So I'm just, I'm definitely, definitely not following like a formula or stuff. I'm just layering stuff until it sounds good, sort of. When you're doing this layering, do you always start with the bass? I personally do, but... I mean, in this case, it was just a sort of thing and I was like listening to this bit without the strings first and I thought like, yeah, it needs this sort of melody going on over the, over the top. Started out with one of them, like pitching it out, you know, moving it up and down octaves, uh, finding a good place for the first one and then just like adding onto it. So it's not so much uh, like starting with a certain one. I had an idea and uh, so so I'm trying to make that idea sort of happen. So my question for you, Lucas, is uh, this is a question I ask everyone. I'm, I'm going to change it a little bit. Uh, but basically the question is, if you if you could go back in time and basically recreate this, I'm not usually I ask people if you can go back in time and basically coach yourself. But I'm going to say if you went back in time and you wanted to recreate this again, you know, with all the knowledge and, and, and wisdom that you have now, if you went back in time and wanted to create it again, would you do anything differently? Would you would you do certain things to make it go quicker? Would you do you know? Would you avoid certain things? You, know, you see what I'm saying? I think I'd stem more things down definitely. Interesting. Why so? Uh, because I mean, like stuff like this, uh, like the staccato thing over here. Like that doesn't need to be like three separate tracks and a group as well. I could just render that out. And I mean, like the mixing process isn't different for these really. Like they're sort of harsh and sort of not harsh in the same areas. So I could just slam one EQ on one track instead of having lots of different ones. Gotcha. And you feel like that would save you a lot of time and a lot of basically mental power? A lot of CPU power at least. Because like towards the end of a track, that's what I'm running out of. It's the CPU. It, what else? Is, is there anything else that you would do to kind of say save you some time or make the process go easier i don't know trying to be a bit more structured in it i think like maybe i see a lot of people say that they want to like have a full like track structure going on before they like delve into the uh, the thick of it sort of uh, i think that'd be a good idea for me to do as well i mean sometimes i'll do that because i'll just be like oh yeah i want this track to go like this and that and then do that thing because i want that to happen uh, and i'll just like yeah do like what i've done with these locators just map out sort of what i want to go on uh, but i have a lot of trouble following stuff like that because i'm constantly like getting new ideas and i want to do different stuff every time i sit by the track yeah so a different one to normal uh but so something uh i suppose i asked it in the first two episodes what was the most difficult part of this track i mean i mean you mentioned say like, like the drop section change like always changes by the by the time you get from beginning to end um yeah what was the most uh challenging part i think it's the mix down process this is the most difficult one for me i mean partially because you've got so many sounds going on at the same time most like jabbing in and out of each other and stuff like that uh, so stuff like really needs to fit each other and meld so it's not like oh this one has, this sound has barely got any mid-range and then the next sound has a lot of mid-range because then the mix just ends up sounding very weird and jumpy and all over the place so that's a bit of a difficulty because there's a lot of very different sounds going on as well yeah i mean just thinking about it the mix down had to be kind of a nightmare Ah, that sucks, dude. I mean, have you found a, a, a way to kind of help you make sense of the chaos? I mean, or is it still just kind of a crapshoot right now? I mean, like stemming down helps a lot with the, like the mental part of it, feeling like you've finished something. Like if you've got a group of different percussion, just like leveling them out, taking out hard frequencies and making sure that they're pretty even frequency response sort of uh, and then just rendering that out to one track that's like five less tracks to think of and it looks nicer in the project as well do you do mastering uh, in the project or outside of the project a uh, bit 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 random but... well this one it was uh, i had one master done by Volso first but then uh, austin himself ended up uh, making a master for it as well because i'm not really a mastering champ gotcha. uh, and it's nice just like when i'm working on a track i'll usually just hate the mix down uh, so there's like no idea for me to do the master as well because then I'm just going to hit it even more when it's squashed. Someone who hasn't heard the track just millions of times in a row is working on it. Uh, they've got a completely different set of ears. Be able to be a bit more constructive sort of in the mastering process because otherwise I'll just be hearing all the problems that I didn't fix in the mix and I'll try to be fixing that in the master and it just ends up being detrimental to the to the final product. Sort of. And, and do, you, do you find you have to leave more than just like a day or two between working on the track to get fresh ears? Or, or can you kind of reset your ears a little bit after a, a, day, a day or so? Ah, it usually takes a while for me. Uh, I mean, if it's something new that I'm working on, it'll be like, yeah, I hate this and quit. And then the next day I'll listen to it again and be like, oh, this is great. But with like 
track stuff finished, it usually takes months for me to like actually appreciate the tracks for what they are instead of what I wanted them to be. Because that's the thing that I've been thinking about a lot lately is uh, like as a producer, you just hear what you're trying to make and how it isn't what you want it to be. But someone who hasn't heard the whole process doesn't know what it sounded like at first and doesn't know what you're going for either. They just hear it for what it is. I wanted to say this about uh, the mastering thing really quick. So just like with the whole workflow thing that we were talking about earlier where some people can crank it out in a day, some people can crank it out in a month. I feel like it's the same thing with mastering. Mastering is its own beast because I've heard basically two different, well, uh, more than two, but basically two different schools of thought where it says master your own stuff or don't master your own stuff basically and so and i've heard good reasons for both i've heard good reasons for people who just want to master their own stuff so they can get it done and quick and be efficient and have that talent which is fantastic and then there's people like what you're saying where you're like and trivecta brought this up too where it's like hey i kind of want to step away from this right now and i want a new pair of ears to come and listen to it and and basically unbiased opinion make it better and that's fine like you know what i mean to me there's no right or wrong. It's just what works best for your workflow. If you know, Lucas, if that's what works best for you, dude, high five. We're completely in a subjective industry right now. So there's no right or wrong. And if someone's making fun of you for it, or if someone's, you know, kind of, kind of bashing you for it, sorry, they don't belong here because that's what the entire industry is about is breaking the rules and doing what you want. You know what I mean? Yeah. Cause like everyone's got a different process with everything. Like just from starting the track to like playing it out live and stuff like that. It's, everyone's got a different process for everything. Exactly. And I shouldn't say they shouldn't, they don't belong here. I, everyone belongs here. I, I should have said, I'm sorry. They're, they're going to have a really rough time because once they get into the nitty gritty of it, basically in the entire music industry is built off breaking rules and, and basically like forging your own path. Would you like our feedback on, on this song? Yeah, definitely. Can always learn something new. So I loved how you how you said, you know, you use basically your markers up top to take notes. I would like to give you uh, an idea about how to do it differently, because that way then you can kind of have basically your arrangement look a little bit cleaner. So what I found and, and what a lot of people don't use is the info text box. Do you know where the info text box is? You see what I'm saying? So what I would do, um, so actually in my in my session, I have a MIDI track and the MIDI track is called a notepad. And what that is, is I can go and I can create a MIDI clip anywhere I want. And then uh, exactly notepad. And let's say, yeah, like right there, you create a MIDI thing. You can right click that and then you can go to edit text. Uh, yeah, edit text info and write all your, your stuff in there that you want. This is... <laughs> so that way it's just it's really clean you can go you can delete stuff you can edit stuff as you need to and for the uh, you know for the for the person who comes in and sees this it's basically hidden unless you want them to see it you know what i mean it just looks clean it's good you can move it around you can duplicate it kind of a thing and so it's it's to me that's kind of the best note-taking strategy i've found thus far it's a good way because sometimes like these would be very long because there's a lots of ideas that you want to do and so that that was one thing that i wanted to, to post to you another thing that i wanted to post to you is um i believe they're called spitfire does is, is spitfire a company that does a lot of cinematic stuff i'm pretty sure it's spitfire um anyways they have this pack uh covex frequency roommate told me about this but basically there's a pack on there it's i, I can it's like ghostly piano or something like that it's like it's a really eerie beautiful kind of cold sounding piano that it's 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 amazing it sounds beautiful and it's three bucks and all the money goes to charity with that specific pack i you know after listening to some of the things that you're using here a lot of orchestral stuff a lot of cinematic stuff i feel like you could really really benefit from that it's actually a really really beautiful track the the, the last piece of advice that i have for you is so for example i noticed in the second part of the drop when you were messing with uh, christina's voice and you threw it up an octave and everything so which is cool i love creating harmonies that way what i posted you do you have melodyne have you ever messed with the formant shifting on there okay cool cool so we've brought this up before um i've i've, I've encouraged people to play with formant shifting on micro shift by uh, sound toys i've also encouraged people to play with it on uh manipulator by infected mushroom but i've noticed that uh, a lot of people don't know you can do this and uh, we kind of have this theory is that this is what skrillex used in his uh, red lips remix before manipulator was really a thing because manipulator is arguably the easier way um to to do a lot of format shifting or or micro shift anyways in uh in melodyne it actually gives a really 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 gorgeous tone to it 
And so again, for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, basically uh, when you tune a vocal or you create harmonies, if you do it like how uh, Lucas did it here with Ableton, you basically, you have uh, really three choices. You can go an octave up, an octave down, or you can go a fifth up and the fifth up only works sometimes because then it could potentially get out of key sometimes. But uh, so it, you're kind of more so limited, but if you do formant shifting, the, the vocal that you formant shift is always singing the same notes. It never goes out of key, but the tone of it changes. So let's say, you know, for example, if I'm singing and I, and I throw the, the, the formant up all of a sudden, I sound like a woman. It sounds like, you know, a, a higher voiced version of me is singing this but I could, it doesn't just have to be an octave. It could be four whole steps up kind of a thing. It, it just, you know, whatever you want. Uh, but basically the reason why I bring this up is I've noticed the tones I get from it. They're just, they're beautiful, man. There's just something about it's just so clean and crisp and unique. So I'd highly encourage you to continue. So you said you played with it. I highly encourage you to continue to play with that just because it's, it's, it's freaking awesome, you know? Yeah, uh, there's the, there's, there are loads of good examples of that stuff. Uh, if you know Black Bear, he does a lot of that, just pitching up, uh, no, not pitching up, but playing around with the formants. Awesome. And I love it. It's a very nice, like, sort of auditory illusion because it sounds like it's pitching up or down, but it's like the pitch is not moving. Uh, Copycat's done that in a track as well, a one with Max. Oh, I can't remember what it's called. It's out on Inspected, Copycat track. Uh, and he does that in the build up, I think. And Maxim's voice just gets deeper and deeper and deeper, but it's not moving at all. But with all that being said, dude, fantastic song. I love the sequencing. I loved the way that you took the original and created something equally as amazing. C congrats, man. If you take a look at uh, Isotope Vocal Synth, um, I think it's the bottom left oscillator. I always lose track of where everything is. Um, you can do something similar with the, with the formats there, uh, which is lots and lots of fun. But yeah, it's just the, the tone you get is really, really cool. Um, not that I felt like the track needed it, but it's just something that, yeah, vocal, vocal, uh, something, something vocal related that um, I've personally been having an awful lot of fun with. Thank you so much, Lucas, for coming on. We, we really appreciate it, dude. This, is, this has been a really, really fun. Oh, thank you guys for the opportunity.